In this first section, we're going to go over what a function is, what a relation is, and all these review kind of definitions. So first off, a function is a relation where each input value has one and only one output value. So for each input, there is exactly one output, and we'll look at the different representations of how to see that in functions or in relations. And then we have a special type of function, which is called a one-to-one -one function. So it has to be a function, so each input has to have one output, but then for a function to be one-to-one, -one, you need each output to have one input. And then of course, because it's a function, we also need each input to have one output. So these are the definitions, and we'll look at how to see it in different functions. But first, let's talk about what is an input and what is an output. So inputs, usually we refer to as x values, and output, outputs we usually refer to as y values. And now with relations or with functions, there's often an independent quantity and a dependent quantity. These two quantities depend on each other. One affects the other. So the independent quantity usually affects the dependent quantity. So the independent are the inputs or the x values. And then the outputs, or the y values, are the dependent variable. And there's different ways to, to think about that or to say it in a sentence. You can say y depends on x, or you can say y is affected by x, or x is affected by, or x affects y. There's different ways to look at it and say it, and, and we'll see more examples throughout the course. Now let's see different representations of relations, and we'll see which one of these are functions. So for the first one, we have a list of points on a coordinate system, an xy plane. So in this first one, 2 is the x and 3 is the y. So the input is 2, the output is 3. So we want to see, does each input have exactly one output. In other, in other words, are there any repeated inputs? So there's only one input of two, there's only one input of three, there's only one input of five, and there's only one input of six. There's no repeated inputs. Each input has exactly one output. So this is a function. Now the question is, is it one to one? which is asking for each output, is there only one input? So the question is, are there any repeated outputs? So we have an output of three, that's the only output of three. We have an output of four, that's the only output of four. An output of six, it's the only output of six, and then there's only one output of two. So it is also one to one. Now we can see how this looks on a graph, on a picture. So this is a graph of a relation. You want to determine, is this relation, is this graph a function? So for each input, is there exactly one output? And in fact, this one is not an input. We can choose different inputs to say why it's not a, a function. So let's say you have the input of zero here. Right, this is the x value of zero. And we see, what is the y value at zero? Well, that is one here. So we have an output. This point here is zero, one, if you want to write as a point. And then we also have, z if we look at another output of zero, it's up here on one, two, three, four. So we have another point that is zero, four. So there are repeated outputs for the input of zero. So if we plug in zero, we could get one, we could get four as well. So this one is not a function.
now the question is, is it one to one? So one to one now is saying, if you have an output, there's only one output. There's no repeated outputs. And in fact, that's also not true. We can see, uh, again, the point zero one here. If we look at the output of one, so the height or Y value of one, there's also an output right there. So if we look, what is the input of this output of one? If we scroll over, one, two, three, four, and we went left, so this is negative four here. So this point, we could write as negative four as the input or the X, one as the output. So because there are two points with the same output, it is not one to one. So this graph here is neither a function nor is it one to one. In any case, if all we needed was to say it's not a function, if it's something is not a function, then it can't be one to one. Because if we think back to the definition, we need for a function to be one to one, it also has to be a function. So we have to have both those one input for one output and one output for one input. And then this relation here is a mapping relation. There's different names for it. So the idea here is this is the X or the inputs. This is the Y or the outputs. So this is inputs, outputs, X's and Y's. You can think of independent and dependent as well. I'll just put that abbreviation up here, independent, dependent. So we want to see for each input is there exactly one output. So what that means, sometimes it's helpful to think of it as points or as a picture. So here we have three going to one. So the input of three has an output of one. So we would say this is the point three, one. And then we have five going to two. We could say this is the point five, two. And then we have seven going to three. So we could say this is the point seven, three. And then we have nine going to three. So we can say that's the point nine, three. So this is just another way to, to represent this relation. And it's helpful to, to be able to go fluidly between the different representations, whether it's a list of points, a mapping picture like this, or a graph. Now, if we look at all the inputs, there's no repeated inputs. So that means that this is indeed a function. Now let's see if it's one to one. Are there any repeated outputs? If we look at the outputs, we see that there are two outputs of three. So seven has an output of three and nine has an output of three. So it is not one to one, but it is a function. So these are really the three different options that you have for function one to one you can have something that is both a function and one-to-one. -one. If something is not a function, it will never be one-to-one. -one. So this is neither a function nor one-to-one. -one. And then, oh, correction here, you may have already pointed it out, but this one here says one-to-one, -one. it is not one-to-one, -one. there should be an X, excuse me. Uh, so this one's a function, but it is not one-to-one -one because we have the repeat output. So these are all the possibilities, just these three. So there's different ways in tests, we call them, for seeing if something is one-to-one -one or if it's a function. And this is usually best with graphs and we can see a couple of examples with it. So if we have a relation that's a, a graph, to see if something is a function, we can use what's called the vertical line test. which says that if you draw a vertical line across a graph or kind of move your, your pencil in a vertical line across a graph, if that line hits more than one point or if it hits two or more points at, at any time, then that means that it is not a function because that means we have repeated outputs. Uh, so if the vertical line intersects anywhere on the graph in more than one point, then the graph is not a function. Because vertical lines, 
essentially what they do is they look and see different x values, what are the outputs at different x values. For example, if you draw a vertical line right here, then there's only one output here, and this is looking at the input of one, two, three, four. But you know, if we draw a vertical line at one, we see that there's two points right here. So we see that at this vertical line, and we just need to see one vertical line where it hits two points or two or more points, and then that tells us there's repeated outputs for a single input. So that means that there are, uh, there's n this is not a function. So I suggest here pausing and trying your own to draw a function, just a graph. It can be a graph you already had in your head from a previous math class. It can just be a picture. You can draw one that would be a function and you can draw one that would not be a function. So I suggest to pause here and then try to draw a graph that is a function and a graph that is not a function. Now that you have paused and drew your graphs, let's see using the vertical line test if we have functions or not. Now I'll probably draw something different than you did and that's totally fine. So what I'm going to draw is a graph um, that is a function. So let's do just a nice squiggly line like this. I'm gonna draw arrows on it because arrows indicate that it goes on forever. And so this is a function because if we look at different vertical lines and everywhere, no vertical line will hit more than one point. This one hits one point here, one point here, one point here. There's no vertical line that will hit more than one point. Now something that is not a function, let's take a look at, um, so we're trying to get where the vertical line hits more than one point. So we can just draw uh, a circle. This is a relation. We'll actually look at this towards the end of the semester. But if we draw a vertical line almost anywhere except for a couple points, we'll hit more than one point. So because there's two points here, when you draw the vertical line, this is not a function. So no function. So because of that, not a function. Now there's another test that you can do to see if something is one to one. So first it has to pass the vertical line test because it needs to be a function. But then to see if something is one to one, you can do a horizontal line test, which is essentially the same exact thing. So let's write that out and look at how to do a horizontal line test. So first, for a, fun for a relation to be one to one, it has to pass the vertical line test, it needs to be a function, which means each in has one out, or each x has one y. Um, and then the horizontal line test shows us one to one, which means each out has one in, or each y has one x. So on this first one, we can draw a horizontal line just about anywhere. And we see, oh, there's a point there, there's a point there, there's a point here. So this vertical line here hits three points on the graph. It hits the graph three times. So that means that this is not one-to-one -one because it fails the horizontal line test. But it is a function because it passes the vertical line test. And I suggest going through your functions that you drew or your graphs that you drew to see is your graph one to one. If you draw a, ver a horizontal line anywhere, will it hit more than one point? Or if you draw a horizontal line, does it never hit more than one point. If it never hits more than one point, then your graph is one to one. So we looked at functions as points, as graphs, and as that mapping diagram. We can also look at functions as equations, or we can even just look at relations in general as equations, but functions in particular. And this will be one of the 
themes of the course is to have a function or a relation and to be able to go fluidly between all the different representations of the function or of the relation going from an equation to a graph to a table that we'll also see. So here we have uh, the, an equation in function notation for Disneyland adult price um, or adult ticket prices for year X. So what this means, how we read it, it says that um, we're going from 2000 through 2004, that was our data, and X equals zero is saying that you're in the year 2000. So X is the number of years since the year 2000. And so a lot of times we'll see functions are given names. You may have seen in the past equations where you have y on one side, y equals blah, blah, blah. But now we're giving this function notation. So p is the name of the function and you write p parentheses x. So you say p of x, p of x. That's how you would say this. So p is the name of the function, x is the input of the function. We can see p of x is equal to, and it has this equation. The equation is, is essentially telling you what to do with the input. So in this example, you have some input x, and you plug in x, and then what the equation is telling us to do is to first uh, multiply multiply by 2.15 and then once we multiply by 2.15 we add 40.85 this is just going through order of operations you know the whole PEMDAS we do parentheses then exponents then multiplication and division and then addition and subtraction so multiplication first and then we do the addition um, oops this should say then add 40.85. We don't just do 40.85, we add 40.85. Um, and then we'll have the output, which is P of X. So let's see how we can use that. And there's two different scenarios when we're given a equation in, as a function, is we can be given the input and figure out what the output is, or we can be given the output and figure out what the input is. So in this example, we have p of 13. Right? That's how you would say this in quotes. I'm say p of 13. So this tells us the input is 13 and asks us to find output. But in the context of this problem, we always want to think about context. This means we're in the year 2013. And then the output is we're looking at the ticket price. A little bit more than that, the ticket price of an adult at Disneyland in the year 2013. So what we do is we write P of 13 is equal to, we want to plug 13 in for x, We're replacing x with 13. So 2.15, and just to emphasize that, I'm just going to put a space where x is, plus 40.85. And so in that space, that placeholder for x, we're plugging in 13, that's our input. Now I suggest pausing right here and trying to work this out on your own, get a little refresher on how to do order of operation, multiply by the 2.15 and then add the 40.85. So pause here and try to work that out. Now that you've worked that out, let's see um, what we should get here. So we have 2.15 times 13 and we get 27.95 plus 40.85, we add 40.85 to 27.95, and we get 68.8. Now, we want to keep this in mind, the context. So this is P of 13 is equal to 68.8.
So what is this telling us? The input is 13, that's the year, or the number of years since 2000, and then the output is 68.8. So what is that measuring? Well, that's measuring ticket price. So this is 68.8 dollars. We always want to remember if there is a unit, what the context is. So we can say in 2013, we expect ticket price to be $68.8. Well, we're talking about money, so we can write 80 cents. Now for the other scenario where we have P of X is equal to 100, this is giving us that the ticket price is $100. Um, so we're given output is 100, I mean, we can say $100. So that's the ticket price. And we're asked to find the input. which is the year. Well, technically the input is years since 2000. So let's set up our equation. We're saying the output or P of X is 100. So in our equation here, we have 100. Remember, this is what P of X is, is equal to, so we're plugging in 100 on the left side of our equation. And then we have that right side. So this is 2.15x plus 40.85. Now we want to solve for x. So this is another scenario where I suggest pausing it and trying to solve for x, or at least thinking about what should I do first? What's the goal here? Now that you've thought about that, or maybe you were able to remember and work it out, let's work it out together. So we want to solve for x, we need to get x by itself. So first we have to get rid of the 40.85. It's adding, so we want to subtract 40.85. Those subtract to zero, so we subtract 48.85 on the other side. We always have to make sure whatever we do on one side, we have to do the same thing on the other side because we have to make everything equal. So 100 minus 40.85 is 59.15 and this is equal to leftover is 2.15x and now we want to get rid of the 2.15 so whenever we're solving always think about what is this number doing to x is it adding subtracting multiplying dividing this number is multiplying to x so to undo multiplication, we divide. So we want to divide by 2.15. Those divide to 1. So we have to divide by 2.15 on the other side. And what we get when we divide 59.15 by 2.15 is 27.5. There's more decimals there, but we'll just round it off at the nearest decimal is equal to x. But what does that mean? What did we just find? Well, x, if we recall, represents the number of years since 2000. So what we have here is, this is years since 2000. So we can write this in a sentence and say, in, so this is going to be the year um, 2027 or 2028, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in 2027 or 2028, we expect ticket price to be $100. 
And I'm using this word expect here because we don't know for sure what's going to happen then. We're just using this equation as an estimate to sort of predict values in the future based on the patterns or the growth that we've seen. And it may or may not be true, but in the end, it's just a prediction. So we've worked out different ways of finding outputs of functions given the inputs. So for this first one here that we're going to look at different representations, like an equation like we just saw, and then a graph, and then the mapping diagram. So I first suggest pausing here and trying to work out what each of these outputs are for these inputs of negative 3, negative 11, and 0. So pause right here, try to work those out, and then once you worked out these ones, or at least made an honest attempt, then come back and resume the video. Now that you work these out, let's take a look together at how to do these. So I always like to write a little placeholder in space for x. So we have negative 4, and then we're putting in a placeholder for x. Regardless of what we're plugging in, I like to write that out squared plus 7. So it's, this is kind of a similar formula to the last one, but we have this extra exponent, the square in there. So what we're plugging in is negative 3. So remember, order of operations, parentheses, and then exponents. There's nothing to do in the parentheses here. It's just negative 3. So then exponent is 2. So we have negative 4. So what we're doing is we're doing negative 3 squared. So that's negative 3 times negative 3, which is 9. And then we still have plus 7. So there's something I'd like to talk about before we go further on this one, a little bit of a side note about the negative 3 squared. So what I'm going to open up is the Desmos calculator. This calculator is a scientific calculator. I will allow you to use it on the assessments, and I suggest using it when you're working on homework assignments and things like that. It is a very useful calculator that has just about all the functions that we'll need. There's a graphing version of this that I'll also talk about. But this is the Desmos calculator. So to do this calculation in Desmos, or in any calculator really, if we were just to type negative 3 squared, so do squared here in Desmos, you have this option here, squared. If we hit enter, it looks like, I can zoom in on here, it looks like it just says negative 9. However, it's not just negative 9. I wrote down on the notes that it's, it should be positive 9 because we're doing negative 3 squared. That's negative 3 times negative 3. So the difference here is parentheses. And the calculator uses our order of operations. So without the parentheses, the way the calculator reads this is it says do the exponent first, do 3 squared, and then apply the negative after. So if you're squaring or doing exponents for negative numbers, you want to use parentheses. So we do parentheses, negative 3, close the parentheses, and then do the square. Now that gives us the correct value of positive 9. So be careful with that when you're using calculators, is that if you're squaring or doing exponents with negative numbers, to put the negative number in a parenthesis. So back to the problem. Now we're doing negative 4 times 9 because multiplication is next. This is negative 36 plus 7. So we have negative 36 plus 7. This is equal to negative 29. So when we plug in negative 3 as our input, we have negative 29 as our output. So we could write this as a point, negative 3, negative 29. And then for negative 11, it's kind of the same deal. We just plug in negative 11 into the x spot. So I'm going to leave a placeholder again. Negative 4 times stuff squared plus 7. And that stuff is negative 11. So negative 11 squared, you can use the Desmos calculator, or maybe you remember what 11 squared is. This should be 121 plus 7. You multiply negative 4 by 121, and we have this is negative 484 plus 7. So then we add 
the seven and we have this is negative 477. So maybe you can think about what this point would be. How would we write this statement that we just found as a point where negative 11 is the input, negative 477 is that corresponding output. So the last one is zero. This one's nice. It's less math, less work we have to do. So negative four times stuff squared plus seven. And that stuff is zero. So this is going to be zero squared, which is zero. So it's negative four times zero, which is zero. Anything times zero is zero. And we have the plus seven that comes along for the ride. So at the end of the day, this is just seven. And again, I suggest trying to figure out how do we write this as a point. Zero is the input, seven is the output. Now moving on to the next representation of a function or a relation is a graph. So with a graph, there's not equations or calculations that we do. And oftentimes you won't be able to write an equation for this graph. So what we can do is we just look at this visually. So if we're given this function g of x, and this first question is saying, the input is negative four, what is the output? So we look for negative four as our input or as our x. Remember, x values go left and right. So we want to go along the x value by four. It's negative, so that tells us to go to the left by four. So one, two, three, four. This right here is the x value of negative four. So we see, we sort of draw a vertical line, and we see the output or the height of this graph when x is negative four is, what is that, one, two, three, and we're going down, so that's negative three right there. So we have this point negative four, negative three. So when we say g of negative four, this is saying x is negative four, and then the y or the output is negative three. And then g of one, we do the same thing. So it's positive one, so we go to the right by one. And this one's a little off-centered. You might have to zoom in or squint your eyes. You know, somewhere in between, the output is somewhere in between zero and one. So let's just say 0.5. So it has a height of 0.5, or you can say one half. But that is what the output is right there at one. And then lastly, we have g of negative 11. Now if you look at that or think about that one for a minute, g of negative 11, if we count to the left by 11, that's kind of off the screen, off the picture. And the graph stops at negative four. So what that means is that g of negative 11 is undefined, it has no output. We, can't, we cannot evaluate g of negative 11 because there is no output for negative 11 as the input. So this one is, uh, I won't even say equal, let's draw an arrow and say undefined. Um, you might also hear it called um, d and &E, which stands for does not exist. And I believe on the homework system, oftentimes if something is undefined or does not exist, you would type in DNE. &E, so it's good to keep that in mind. Now on this mapping diagram, you know, we have the X's on the left, the Y's on the right, or the inputs, outputs. So we're looking at H of two. Two is the input here. And we wanna see where is two going or what is two mapped to. So two is mapped to, if we follow the arrow, five. So nice and easy, just see where's the arrow going. And then for negative three here, we can see negative three goes to, well, also five. So think about if we have two different inputs that have the same output, what does that tell us? Well, that tells us that because of this, so we say, so this is not one to one. Because it has repeated outputs for two different inputs. And on that same note, think about is this relation, is this mapping a function or not? 
I'll tell you that it's not a function. Try to look at the graph and maybe write out what the different points are or look at the map and write out what the different points could be and see maybe why is this not a function. So I'll leave that one up to you. Now this last one, h of negative 11, well if we look at the input possibilities, there's no input of negative 11. So again, this is undefined. I'm just going to write d and e for brevity. But there's no way to evaluate h of negative 11 because we don't have negative 11 here. So now lastly, let's take a look at a graph here that's given to us with a context. So we have a deposit is made into an interest bearing account. Now, if you're not familiar with accounts or interest, interest bearing account, all that means is you put money in account and because the bank borrows your money, they lend it out to other people, you get interest. They pay you for borrowing your money. So you get a little bit of interest over time and there's different types of those interest bearing accounts, but that's the main idea. So here we say this is uh, a graph of this account where the balance, the output, is denoted as B of T. So the outputs here are the balance of the account. And then the horizontal, the inputs or the depend or independent values are the years. And we use T as the variable for that. So we want to ask how much was the original deposit? Now this is when I suggest for each of these to pause and think about the answers to these questions or think about these questions and see if you can figure out what are the solutions to them or how would I figure these out. So pause here and look at each of these questions. So hopefully you thought about each of these individually and we can now talk about them. So we want to see how much was the original deposit. Original deposit, that means how much money did you have at the start? Well, at the start, that's time or year zero. So if we look at year zero here, what is the height of the graph or what is the output? Well, that's $1,000. So we started with $1,000. And then the next one's asking to estimate B10 and then to think about it in this context. So B10 or B of 10. So we're saying 10 is the input, 10 is the X. So, or in this case, I should say T, not X. So 10 is the input. So we look at where do we have 10 here? And we see what is the output at year 10 or after 10 years? And we see it's 2000. So we can write in math language, B of 10 is equal to $2,000. Which is to say that after 10 years, the account, or we can just say the balance, the amount of money in the account is $2,000. So that's how we would interpret that. And then lastly, we're going to find T. So we're going to find the year when the balance is $5,000. So here we're looking at I want $5,000 in my account. How long will that take is this question. So we look at the output of $5,000. We see where is the graph? Oh, it's right here. Well, it's kind of in between 20 and 25. It goes down. It's kind of in the, in the middle. So you could say 22, 23. Um, we're not trying to be super precise with this because the labeling isn't super precise. So we would say um, B of... 22 is equal to $5,000. Or we would say T is equal to 22 years or 22 and a half, however you want to talk about it. And that's all we have for right now.